was just a month ago that we were all here, if you remember. Uh, and when we left in December, there was still much left to do on behalf of North Carolinians. We have several issues that need to be addressed this session and much that we'd like to accomplish to start making a positive impact again on people's lives and in strengthening North Carolina. We have a major disaster that needs to be fully addressed. We talked about that a month ago, some of us uh, three or four months ago. But we have families that remain uncertain about their health care. We have state workers and retirees that haven't seen a substantial pay raise in several years. We have toxic legislation that remains on the books and a public education system that is struggling to meet the needs of all of our children. But of course, the biggest task before us as we gather here uh, to begin this session is the budget. We're looking forward to seeing Governor Cooper's budget proposal, which will serve as a blueprint for his plan to protect and support North Carolina's resources. And that includes everything from our parks and waterways to our people and the institutions that serve them. To that point, I want to stress that there is no greater resource to be found in North Carolina than the people who live here. That is who we serve. That is who we strive to protect, and that is why we are back here in Raleigh. As the political adage goes, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget, and I will tell you what you value. If we value our people, then we need to invest in their success. That begins with a renewed investment in our public education system, from teacher and administrator's pay to restoring textbooks, spending levels, so that they achieve what they were set to do, and expanding programs in our public schools. There's no greater return on investment than the investment that we make in our students here in North Carolina. The success of our public schools has to be our first priority. And until our public schools are fully funded and our principals and teachers have every resource they need to help their students succeed, then we cannot afford to divert public tax dollars to private education. We're moving in the wrong direction in public education spending and in student achievement. And it will undoubtedly take time and a sustained investment to make up for the ground that we've lost here. But there are actions that we, as a legislative body, can take now that can have an immediate impact on the quality of life of the people that we serve. Right now, there is no greater priority for us than to address the remaining unmet needs of those that were impacted by Hurricane Matthew. We left a lot on the table in December, and people have remained in limbo in the month since we first addressed this in a special session. We're looking at continued funding, repairing infrastructure, getting state dollars and grants to get businesses open again, and ensuring that the internal structures that, that should be in place are in place to respond in future disasters. The federal government has offered assistance, but I have no doubt that with our own rainy day fund at its current level, we can address all other gaps and assistance and help people move forward. We have experience at this, successful experience over the last 15 to 20 years with storms that have occurred in this state. And that's not all that we can do as we get back to work to help people now and move our state forward. <coughs> Second point, our North Carolina teachers deserve a real pay raise. For a long time, we've heard a lot about raising teacher pay, but with no real action. We talk about it in election years and never again. If we're going to teach our students the skills to compete for the best jobs, then they need to treat our educators like the professionals that they are. North Carolina is the ninth largest state in the nation, but currently ranks 41st in teacher pay. That's just not good enough. Too many good teachers are leaving the classroom and state for better pay. We need to take a hard look at state revenue this coming session and pass a plan that will offer a meaningful pay raise and make us competitive with other states. And we need to apply that to all state employees and our retirees as well. You mentioned teacher pay, but you also mentioned expanding um, other programs in public schools. Could you expand upon what kinds of programs and education initiatives you're looking to push this session? Uh, they're familiar ones. 
we are funding textbooks for students at an historically <coughs> low level, far lower than uh, what we were funding it going into 2008. We also have serious digital needs in classrooms across the state. Uh, we, we need to basically do software stuff for kids uh, so that they are part of this digital age that we live in. Not just kids uh, in some of the rural areas, although the effort has to be greater there uh, to make sure that they can take advantage of high-speed internet and those things, but also kids uh, in, in urban areas. Again, the economy in this state is kicking up, doing well, uh, and it is time that we really invest in the things that are really going to give us a greater return downrange, and that that investment has to be in the young people in the state, and the way that we do that is through our public education system. NC Pre-K. There shouldn't be a waiting list for NC Pre-K. Mm -hmm. And one thing that has been missed in the discussion about teacher pay is that uh, it has to be focused upon is that principal pay in North Carolina is at 50th among the 50 states. We're not even up at number 41. We're nowhere close to the median. And if you want good, effective administrators in your public schools to manage and operate them and supervise them, you can't be at the bottom of the pay scale in this country and expect to attract or keep that kind of talent. Did one of the education people have, I, I thought I saw some. Mr. Clear, can I speak on one of those? Yeah, Mike. I think one education issue that's pressing that we ought to address fairly quickly is the class size question that we implemented last year. I know we're hearing a lot from our teachers, from our school boards, from our superintendents. One of the immediate needs in education I think we need to address fairly quickly is the classroom size that we imposed last year, this unfunded mandate that we put on our school districts. Uh, I know my district, and I suspect all my colleagues in both houses are hearing from their superintendents, their school boards, uh, and their teachers that by uh, putting that cap in there and by not funding it, what we're doing is we're running the risk of losing um, those classes that are not part of the core curricula. Uh, we're going to lose uh, we're going to lose music, we're going to lose arts, we're going to lose PE, and a whole range of other things. Secondly, uh, it's putting a press on the capital needs of these schools by forcing this cap without the funding on there. So to your question, I think that's an immediate need in education that we ought to work on in a bipartisan, bicameral way. And I think we can work with our public colleagues to do that. Any reaction to can the Can I say something to that, please? <clears throat> Having just spent 12 years on Guilford County's Board of Education before coming here, I also can speak to the fact that not just teachers are not making them up, but there are other professionals in the school buildings who support our children learning as well. We have bus drivers who don't make a, a, a living wage. We have cafeteria workers who don't make a living wage. And then we have infrastructure needs in each of our schools. Throughout the 70s and 80s in this state and in this country, we, we weren't building school buildings. So now we're going back and addressing infrastructure needs. In every county in this state, there are children who are in buildings that are too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter, and have leaks in their roofs, and that has to be addressed as well. So when we talk about education in the state, teacher pay is paramount, but there are other professionals that support our teachers and support our students, and we have tremendous infrastructure needs as well. Okay, we're going to take one last question and shut it down. It's on class size. That bill that was filed today, I don't know if anyone's had a chance to peruse it, but just asking uh, for your thoughts on this bill modifying class size requirements. I've seen it. I've seen it. Basically, it is. What is that? In fact, I just saw it before I came in here, and I got a call from WITN, I believe, about it. Um, I think it's being introduced by Representative McGrady mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and Elmore and some others. But basically, what I got out of it is that they were going to have uh, K through third grade to have a ratio maybe one to seventeen students, and then. On down the list, they have another group of one to one teacher per so many children. And my understanding is that they can have a waiver, if you will, whereby they can go up to three additional students for the kindergarten levels, as well as six additional students for, I think, the third graders. So they're trying to give some leeway to give people an opportunity to increase the range a little bit in terms of children if they need to do so. And this, I understand, is to avoid the problem of losing 
are through physical education teachers. And, 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 and thank you, and of course, we'll, we'll look at it. We get a chance, but also, typically, reduction in class size bills have to take into account the need for additional classroom space. Yes. And we have to all know that if we do that, especially in districts uh, that can't, very few of them in the short term can do it, uh, but clearly there are a good number of them that can't do it long term. So we would be uh, very vigilant in looking at that. Thank all of you for coming, uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you during the session.